be a safeguard for veterans, wandering souls, and people who just need a place to call home. Thank you for you guys being able to maintain this. The commitment, the endurance, the stressful days, sleepless nights, in order to maintain the tradition is the backbone of this community and of the American spirit. Everybody in this room rocks. Um, you should all be proud. When the commander at the time, Charles Hoffman, decided to honor Cloyd K. Davis' sacrifice that was made in World War I by establishing this legion, he anticipated that this legion would last. Because of everybody's dedication, the honorable men and women in this room have made good on his word. The commitment that he made has been carried on for several generations. I'm proud of this place, all of you guys, and I knew this building was hollow ground when I arrived here back in November. We've all poured our hearts and souls into this place, and it will stand for another 100 years. So help me God. So Post 150 is not only a tremendous place that has my heart, but what this building means to everyone here is what I also wanted to put inside this mural. Before we start to talk about that, I want to make sure that these artists also get some recognition. So if you guys don't mind, that was kind of embarrassing, I want you guys to stand and be recognized. Thank you very much. So we had we had Alyssa Lyons, Sean Gallagher, Deville, Drugs, did they die? Is that close enough? Close enough. Right. <laughs> I'm a history teacher, not a language English teacher. Um, Adam Payton and Shay Ryder. Uh, but I also want to give Shay another moment to be honored. Um, she was the powerhouse of this mural. Um, when Adam and I signed on to this thing, we had never painted anything before in our lives. And <laughs> So it was a very ambitious endeavor that we undertook, and I don't think we really realized what we were getting into. But when Shay signed on for this, she made the faces come to life, she made the backgrounds come to life, and we couldn't have done it without her. So Shay, thanks again for your time. after Congress chartered the first legion, this location made American history. And now, 100 years later, we catalog what this nation has been through in order for us to be here today. <clears throat> now let's talk about this mural. Would you like to introduce the people that are coming up? Sure. Okay. I think we're going to do one by one. One by one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, but before we get started with that, all of you guys who are in the doorway, you're not going to be able to see this. If you want to come down and stand along the wall, there are five seats in here. One seat there. Yep, a couple in the back. So, and we're glad you're here. And we want you to be able to see. <laughs> There are two in the second row here. I tried to keep Okay, so for our first panel, for our first panel, we are very blessed to have with us Mary Ann Davis Metz. She is the niece of Cloyd K. Davis, whom this, uh, this post is named after. So in a way, he was a founding father of this post, which will tie into this panel, as you will see. Marianne, if you wanna come up, please. And... Give it a cute little tug. Just this one? Yeah, both, both, both. Both, both. Oh, grab, yeah. grab both. And bring it down. going to work. <laughs> so this is our first uh, panel out of the 10. 
Um, as Shay introduced, um, as far as the Founding Father concept goes, we started this panel with uh, our, our nation's father, George Washington, looking in the direction of our nation's future. Um, Shay poured her heart and soul into the fire, the characters, the faces, the horse. Um, this was her baby, and so it's a, it's a beautiful panel, and it does a good job of kicking off this, this mural right. Um, there's a lot of Easter eggs in this, so when you guys have time, uh, come up and look at each individual panel. There's a lot of hidden things there waiting for you. Um, but on the surface, um, it's at uh, Valley Forge, and we've got a couple soldiers um, hanging out, getting ready to go whoop some ass for our country. <laughs> and for our second panel, we have Mr. Glenn Metz. Um, this panel was called The Star Spangled Banner, War of 1812. And when I think of the Star Spangled Banner, I think of patriotism, sacrifice, and service. I also thought first of Glenn, who will reveal this panel. He served his country, and he continues to serve his community. I believe at the time after um, Glenn uh, served, he didn't serve during the dates at that time that were eligible to be member of American Legion, but he has never let that stop him from serving this American Legion. He's never missed a Memorial Day in over 40 years. I think someone said it might even be more than 50 years. Um, each Memorial Day, we have seen Glenn put on his Marine uniform and place the wreath at the grave of the military member to be honored that day. So Glenn, if you will please. So this was our War of 1812 panel, and um, when Adam and I were brainstorming about all these, this was our first interactive panel out of three. Uh, we wanted to be able to give the observer the feeling as though he's directly involved. And so the perspective that we wanted to communicate with this one, um, you know, when you think of the War of 1812, or you think of, um, you know, the, the battle at Fort McHenry, it's always like from a naval perspective or the American's perspective. Well, as the high school history teacher and me, I'd like to teach you guys that Francis Scott Key was actually a prisoner on a British war vessel at the time. So his vantage point was from the fort. And at dawn's early light, that's why he decided to write that song, because he saw that our flag was still there. So that's what we try to communicate with this panel. For the Civil War panel, we have Bill Leitner. He is one of our most active legionnaires right now, and his great-grandfather, Peter R. Rupert, fought in the Civil War. He served in the infantry, Company C, 45th Regiment. Mm -hmm. I had written this, I forgot that Bill was gonna bring this. Um, Bill proudly displays uh, this honorable discharge certificate of Peter Rupert, which goes into great detail about his service and listing the places served and the dates. It's basically a <coughs> historical document. It was signed on October 20th, 1864, when Mr. Rupert was honorably discharged. So Bill, if you would please. try to communicate the aftermath of Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. Um, as you can see, we've got the, uh, the last moments of a Confederate soldier uh, being clutched by you know, a, a Union soldier. And we wanted to capture that this event in our nation's history was the most painful. That's why we were willing to take the risk of showing a little blood there. Um, but it was the worst time in our nation's past, and it will never happen again. Um, but it could be inferred that because the hair color is the same and the eye colors are the same, that they're related, in fact, that they could be brothers. And so that this is a testament to the fact that our nation was that divided at that time. Um, and again, the Union soldier is looking in the direction of history on purpose. For the World War I panel, we have Regina Ormsby. 
Her grandfather, Charles M. Hoffman, was a sergeant in the United States Army and a Purple Heart recipient. And he was also our post's first commander. He was shot by the enemy in France and was taken off the field by his comrades to a nearby farm where the family nursed him back to health. Sergeant Hoffman sustained a chest wound. The, bully, the, the bullet barely missed his lung. And a notebook that he kept in his pocket kept the bullet from going all the way through. After he came home, the family that nursed him back to health kept in touch through letters. The family, our family, still has those letters and the notebook that stopped the bullet. So, Regina? trenches. Um, so in uh, World War I, uh, you hear a lot of uh, talk about how they use trench warfare. And the reason for that is because of the artillery shells that were used at the time um, were so devastating that mankind had no choice but to burrow in the ground to survive. Um, so we wanted to give an opportunity to capture, um, not necessarily just as gruesome as it was, but the fact that we have um, some soldiers from the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, uh, communicating with uh, an American soldier there um, on the right. And um, in 1918, America did save Europe um, from total extinction from the German army. Um, and so we figured it was fitting for an American soldier to be uh, in the trenches, more fresh looking um, than the BEF soldiers who had lost millions of lives at this point in time, along with the French. Um, so this is, um, th this is peace in the trenches. And we are very honored today um, to have for our World War II panel, Mr. Lloyd Morningstar. He uh, served in the Navy during World War II. And as you know, we do have quite a few in our, um, in our community, World War II veterans. And Lloyd was stationed on the USS LST 992 landing ship tank. During World War II, LST 992 was assigned to the Asiatic Pacific Theater and participated in the assault and occupation of Okinawa, Junto, in June 1945. One thing in particular that Lloyd remembers was that they were carrying fuel on their landing ship tank. He said if they would have caught a bomb at any time, none of them would have survived. So Lloyd, we are honored that you're here. You represent the greatest generation. You grew up during the Great Depression, fought in World War II, and he continues to live out his faith every single day. Lloyd? also where we start to honor each individual uh, branches of the military with this one. Um, so this is this one's a bird's eye view of Midway. Um, I want to give respect to Sean Gallagher who put that whole scene on the wall uh, out of nowhere. They just got an idea one day and went for it. It was a really really cool thing to watch happen. So thank you Sean for that. Shay did the photograph there um, in the corner. But this is this is the vantage point of a pilot flying over um, Japanese vessels midway. And um, this is our second interactive panel out of the three that we have here for you guys. Um, when it's time, feel free to walk up and I want you guys to be able to put your fist right next to where that guy's holding onto the joystick. And Shay and I spent a lot of time figuring out the angle of the cockpit, but it does look like, if you look close, you're actually inside of this thing. So it's pretty cool. Um, we wanted to add that uh, for you. Um, so yeah, that is uh, bird's eye view of Midway. 
Our next panel is the Korean War panel. Um, I couldn't actually find any Korean War veterans to represent, so I did ask our post historian, Glenn Butler, to do this for me, and I will give you some historical facts about the Korean War. The Korean War began in 1950 when the North Korean Communist Army crossed the 38th parallel and invaded non communist South Korea. As the North Korean Army um, advanced, armed with Soviet tanks, uh, quickly overran South Korea, the United States came to South Korea's aid. In 1953, a peace treaty was signed in Panmunjom that ended the Korean War. And Glennie, as our post historian, would you do the honors? This panel um, is trying to honor the Marines in this one. Um, Shane did the sunrise and the faces there in that one as well. Um, Adam had a great perspective of what Korea would look like since he was there uh, while he was in the military at the time. Um, so this is this is our uh, snow-capped Korean panel. Okay, and for our next panel, um, it's gonna be the Vietnam panel, we have Don Butler. Um, and anybody that knows Don knows that he is a much better speaker than I am, and so uh, he has agreed to say his own um, few sentences on his back. First of all, it's a great honor to be up here on this special day to represent the, uh, the heroes of the war of my generation, the Vietnam War. And as a Vietnam veteran, this is a special occasion for me, too, to be able to do this. You know, it's awful difficult. In fact, it's impossible for folks who haven't worn the uniform to realize the enormity of the, the, the things that have been done by the people that we're talking about here today, the sacrifices made uh, by those folks. There's a great price that's been paid by so many. And if you haven't worn a uniform or if you haven't been close to someone who did wear the uniform, you don't realize all those sacrifices that were made and the cost of, of the freedoms that we enjoy. There are thousands, tens of thousands of gold star families out there today that would be glad to tell you the real cost of freedom. I'd like to tell you that the cost of freedom for our generation is etched on a wall down in Washington, D.C. with the names of 58,000 fallen heroes. Now, everybody that's donned the uniform to me is a hero. I'm proud of every single man and woman that served in every military battle and every, uh, and every uniform throughout the years, but more so, I am extremely proud of the men and women who don that uniform today, who make the never-ending sacrifices to safeguard the freedoms and the liberties that we so enjoy. And for them, I say God bless each and every one of them, and I say God bless each and every one of you. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. This is our Vietnam panel, naming it On Patrol. Um, we thought it necessary um, to uh, honor the Army in this panel as well. And um, we also uh, saw it fitting that we were gonna honor the uh, Military Integrations Act uh, that had passed. Um, so for the first time, um, whites and blacks were in the same unit, same regiments, fighting side by side together, spilling the same color of blood, regardless of their skin color. And uh, we wanted to honor um, every African American soldier who gave his life for this country in Vietnam with this panel. Um, and so we saw it fitting to, to um, include them there for their sacrifice as well. So that's on patrol. Our next panel is the Gulf War panel, and we have Scott Hearn. He is actually um, a legionnaire here as well. He served in the US Army from June 1982 to November 2003. 21 years. Various assignments include 16 years in Germany, Fort Hood, Fort Bragg, and Fort Knox. He was deployed to Bos Bosnia 
um, during August 1998 through 99. And he was a Lance nuclear missile crew member for 10 years, a multiple launch rocket system crew member for 11 years. This guy is a born leader. In the Army, he was a squad leader, team chief, platoon, sar <laughs> platoon sergeant, S2 non-commissioned officer in charge, or NCOIC, battalion master gunner, battalion staff NCO, and the list goes on. He is a Sergeant Morales Club member, member of the Honorable Order of St. Barbara, patron saint of all artillerymen, and airborne qualified. During the first Gulf War, he was stationed in Germany with nuclear missiles. The US military presence remained in Germany to guard against any attacks that the Russians might launch while the rest of our forces were deployed. During the second Gulf War, he was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky as an observer controller trainer, where he spent his last year TDY to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to certify National Guard units that were deploying to the Gulf. So for all those reasons, we tied Scott to this panel. So Scott, if you would please. our Gulf War panel, um, Loading at Dusk. We wanted to honor uh, several other people that haven't been mentioned yet in this uh, travel through time here. Um, so we have our first female combatant. Uh, she's a pilot up against the jet that she is about to take off in. Um, and we also have um, non-infantry, so we have support guys that are being uh, honored there as well, um, using the jammer, which our buddy Adam over here used when he was in the Air Force. Um, he actually made those bombs that's being loaded, and so he put his heart and soul into that panel. That's his baby there. And um, so this was, this was a very special occasion. And this is our third and final interactive panel as well. Um, we wanted you to have the, the feeling that if you put your palms up against you know, the steering wheel and the joystick, that you're actually the one getting the jet ready to take off. Um, and. Uh, I also forgot to mention, DeVille did an excellent job with that Vietnam skyline, by the way. She, does, she deserves some credit for that, too. So, thank you very much. Our next panel is the 9-11 panel. And uh, for this one, we have my everyday hero, my husband, Fred Ormsby. He was stationed on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Juniper WLB-201. The Juniper and her crew handle various miss missions such as aids to navigation, law enforcement, homeland security, ice breaking, environmental pollution response, and search and rescue. The Juniper asso assisted in the recovery operation following the crashes of TWA Flight 800 and Egypt Air 990. She also participated in anti-terrorist and force protection operations in New York City immediately after the September 11, 2001 attacks. For people of a certain age, we can all remember where we were and what we were doing when we heard uh, what was going on on 9-11. I remember that we lived on the Newport uh, Naval Base in Rhode Island, and the public school teachers were on strike at that time. So. Uh, I was out playing in the play, playground with my kids. We had an extended summer. So, and when I came back from the park, I had received a call from my father um, asking me if I was okay. And I didn't know what was going on. That was way before the time of cell phones. And so uh, the next call that I received was Brett saying, pack me a bag, make sure to get me a sleeve of Copenhagen, and bring it to the ship. <laughs> so I threw the bag and the kids in the car, got to the pier gate as it was closing. A quick embrace and a few tears from mostly the kids, and he was gone. The Juniper and her crew went to the surrounding waters of New York City for the next six weeks. So Brett, if you would please.
uh, this one's called The Day the World Stood Still. I was in the third grade when I, on the West Coast, was woken up by my parents to let me know that America was under attack. I didn't see the first plane hit, but I did see the second live on television. And um, it was a bittersweet feeling to be in Afghanistan, my first deployment, hunting down the people responsible for this on September 11th in 2012. Um, this panel uh, honors the Coast Guard. We have Brett's boat, actually, um, in the bottom right-hand corner um, that Alyssa did a phenomenal job with. Uh, Alyssa was able to do the whole New York skyline um, freehand. She did an amazing job, and, um, and the boat as well. And Shay um, did a lot of justice to Lady Liberty. I think she'd be proud. Um, and the smoke of the towers bleeds into our 10th and final panel. So for our 10th and final panel, um, it's the I Iraq and Afghanistan panel. Um, we have Robert Morse. As I stated before, he was uh, serving in the Army from 2011 to 2014 and was deployed to Afghanistan, not once or twice, but three times. So he personally identifies with this panel, and I'll let you get to it. enough to be involved in, uh, in a special operations unit that only goes out at night. So this panel is a night scene. Um, there's a lot of little hidden references in there. Um, but the most important thing to me that I wanted to do was honor my airborne ranger in the sky, Thomas McPherson, who was shot and killed on my first deployment. Um, his weapon and his kit and his helmet is modeled there um, as best as I could. And um, you'll notice he's not alone in this panel, if you look closely. Um, but this is at night, and uh, this was my baby. And uh, you'll notice that the constellation in this panel is the exact same as the one in the first. Um, and this one's named Apollo Lake. let you guys know, like I said, there's a lot of Easter eggs in here, um, but from start to finish, you'll notice that characters <coughs> in this panel, or in this mural, excuse me, um, are holding a book at one point or another. And this first panel here, that's the, that's the focus. This revolutionary war hero um, has a book in his hands, and you'll notice it show up um, time and time again. And, and whether that book is a Bible or a rules of regulations or um, whatever, that's up to you, that's up to the viewer. Um, could symbolize freedom, could symbolize task and purpose, patriotism, but Thomas McPherson has that tucked away behind his breastplate there in his uh, plate carrier, that same book. Um, you'll find it a couple more times in this mural. Um, with that, with closing comments, I wanna give you guys a quote from one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan. Um, this is above my doorway in my apartment. Uh, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Um, so it's up to us. Um, these men and women have done what they needed to do for us to be free today. They did their job, and they didn't have to. Um, and now it's on us um, to honor them. So in closing, I have two challenges for you. Uh, I'm going to be a high school history teacher. I'm dedicating my entire adult life to educating the next generation of kids that are coming up so that they understand the value of this country and the sacrifices that have been made on their behalf. But I can't teach alone. So if you have the opportunity, tell a passerby what you see here, what you've learned here, and what's been done on your behalf in order for this country to remain free and spread awareness for what it takes in order for us to all be as free as we are today. 
And my second challenge for you is to live a life worthy of their sacrifice. We are very, very lucky in this country, and we take all those freedoms and luxuries for granted every day. And so if we took some time to maybe accomplish that goal that we wanted to do five years ago, or you know, when 2020 first started, this year's been crazy. Um, but if we took the time to honor these men and women with our lives, I think this country would be a better place. So the last comment I have for you guys is that uh, as far as I go and the painters go, we had a lot of fun doing this, but we didn't really do it for ourselves. Um, the reward was in the experience, um, but we did it for everybody in this room. Uh, we did it for the people that have come before us to honor them, um, give them a face, make them relatable. Uh, we wanted to put paint on this wall to honor those that have come before us. But not just that, we also wanted to inspire people that are coming behind us too. Um, the next generation is gonna have to do this. There's more room on that wall that's left. And America's not done fighting wars. And so I think it's necessary um, for the next generation to understand what it's taken for us to be as free as we are today. So that was the second inspiration for us. Um, do you have anything else to say? Okay. Thank you guys very much for your time. to say is um, this mural wasn't my idea. Actually, this mural was Don McGeckran's idea. He likes to hide in the corner. He doesn't want to be up front or whatever, <laughs> and that's okay. But I wanted to give credit. When he was commander from 2014 to 2018, um, they had a lot of goals, and they accomplished many of them except for two. One was a piece of military equipment to be displayed out here at this legion. And the second was this mural that um, we have actually accomplished today. So, um, Dawn, thank you for the, for the idea. And so now to honor all those who have gone before us, all of us here who have served, all of those in the future who will serve. We're going to pause for a moment of silence and then play the tabs. This does conclude our ceremony, except for, I think, our current commander, Cheryl. Did you have a few um, announcements to make? Yes, I just want to thank Okay.